feminism, when we use the term, is not female-centric studies, female-centric interest that goes against family system, that goes against the stability of our families. No, it's gender egalitarianism. It's arguing that men and women are equal in the Quran and they should be treated equal in all aspects of Islam, uh, in theory and in the practice, not only in, in theory, um, no reasonable person will tell you, no, men and women are not equal in the Quran. They will all tell you, yes. Okay, let's come to the to practicing that. And now we have problems, right? Because of the way the tradition processed so many views, we need to move forward with practice, which is normal, which is uh, positive, which applies to everything, including the way we um, uh, make sense of the Quran. Peace, people, and welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Tehran and Roxana. Today, we will be diving into a topic with our esteemed guest that I hope you all will find very interesting. Dr. Abla Hassan is an accomplished expert in Islamic studies, and her book, Decoding the Egalitarianism of the Quran, challenges misconceptions and offers fresh insights into the Quran's perspective on crucial topics such as women's agency, marriage, and much more. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hassan, and thank you for accepting our invitation to this, what I believe to be, will be a very insightful discussion. Wa alaikum assalam, Tiran. Thank you so much for the invitation. My pleasure to be joining you today. Okay, thank you. And it was a pleasure reading your book. And I really hope from this um, talk that we have, other people are encouraged to go um, inquire your work as well, because, you know, with these conversations, you really can't encapsulate all of that. The, the guests we bring on content um, is, is in the book, obviously. So uh, to start off, could you give our listeners a brief introduction to yourself and your background as a scholar in Islamic studies? Absolutely. Uh, one more time, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm Abla Hassan. Originally, I'm from Syria. I got my BA in uh, philosophy from Damascus University. I got my master's degree in philosophy from University of Nebraska-Lincoln, followed by my PhD in philosophy of language from University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I'm the founder and the coordinator of the Arabic studies program now in, in uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, I have three books on Quranic studies. Uh, decoding the egalitarianism of the Quran, which we're going to be discussing today. I have on pain and suffering, a Quranic perspective and the Quranic dilemma. Happy to be joining the conversation today. Um, wow, you really must like Nebraska Lincoln to have been there for so long. Um, Absolutely. Just, just how's Absolutely. your stay? Uh, more than 16 years now. I joined as a student and then I started the Arabic studies program. And it's my home now. This is my home. Two of my kids were born here. I love Lincoln. I love Nebraska. I'm not, I'm not going to uh, lie to you. I love it. Every time I go to any conference, any place, I come back. You know, I never regret I live in this beautiful place. That's wonderful to hear. And what motivated you to delve into the topic of egalitarianism in the Quran? You know, sometimes, especially within the Muslim community, when you use the word egalitarianism, it can be like kind of a, a trigger word for some because of what they think it's indicative of. So, uh, yeah, just what inspired you to delve into this topic? Right. And, you know, to your own egalitarianism is the safe word. Problems start when I say feminism. Right. So if you, we're not there with the problems until you say I'm a feminist or feminism, because people go, maybe we're going to dive into that later on, because people go from gender egalitarianism, from equality between men and women to thinking that we're arguing for uh, fem, like feminine center studies or feminine center arguments, center arguments, right, which is not the case. This is not what we mean by feminism. We're arguing for equality between men and women, which the Quran was one of the earliest books that, that argued for, right? But going back to, to your question, how I get started uh, uh, with, with all of this, right, starting from my first book. Uh, so I'm a veiled Muslim woman and uh, since I arrived here, even as a student, uh, the, the, the fact that I'm a veiled Muslim woman brought attention to my religious identity uh, out of everything else. So I've always received questions on Islam. 
I've been invited to so many um, uh, interfaith talks, uh, talks in churches, panel discussions, academic talks. And it seemed to me that uh, out of all the puzzling questions people have about Islam, the real status of women in Islam is number one question. I'd like to provide good answers. And you can't provide good, uh, good answers until you know the answers yourself, until you're convinced with the answers yourself. So a little bit, I started with that. And then I started to realize that not all the answers that our tradition provided us with are still, you know, well-functioning until today. Uh, some of them, not because they're the original Quranic answers, because this is the way the tradition processed those answers. Some answers worked for their time and place, but now we need to rethink these answers. We still need to connect with the Quran, but we need to adapt the Quran according to our life, ac according to our times, according to our needs, which is built in the Quran itself. It's a Quranic project, right? Because there's a, this a huge claim that all Muslims believe in that this is a universal religion. This is a religion that in principle should be good enough, flexible enough to answer and to respond to the needs of people, all times, all places, all communities until the end of all times. So it started with digging deep into the answers and, and trying to understand the answers, understand the full picture uh, in, a, in order to be able to, to, to respond to questions. Some of these questions are not questions to uh, uh, just um, outsiders, if we can't say. I teach women in the Quran every spring, and now I'm going to be uh, teaching global Islam current debates. Half more of my students are heritage uh, community students. Their parents come from Islamic background. And they have critical thinking. They want to question the faith. They want to understand things deep in the faith. Uh, and uh, they, like, many of, uh, probably I won't be exaggerating if I say uh, this book was just a response to a set of questions that I received for five years before I finalized everything, teaching women in the Quran, before I finalized everything in a book. And in the acknowledgement page, therefore, I have a thank you note to my students, to students who took women in the Quran, because their brave questions is what made me think seriously of the answers I was providing. So it started from questions from, from others, I would say. Um, the, the short answer, or, or probably the long answer to, to your question. Thank you. Um, so in your opening chapter, you, 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 you try to provide a breakdown of some of the systematic sort of exegetical fallacies that resulted in what you argue to be the alienation of the Quranic text from its original very rich gender egalitarian message. Um, and the first of the ones that you talk about is excessive egetical narrativization. Can you explain sort of what exactly that is and how it can sometimes seemingly violate some quite intrinsic Islamic theological beliefs. Right, right. Uh, so as I as mentioned, there is a gap that I noticed and many are noticing between uh, what we read in the Quran and between our current understanding of Islam. This gap, I argue, was almost invisible at the beginning, but unfortunately, it kept widening and expanding. So many times today, when we go back to read about something, like, for example, the progressive status of women in the Quran, right? Uh, we see like we're alienated from those answers, not only outsiders, Muslims themselves. We think like because we only read the Quran, we were only allowed in the tradition to read the Quran in a retrospective way. So the Quran has been alienated as a resource or maybe as the resource to learn about Islam. Now, everyone in theory will tell you, yes, it is the first resource. But in practice, they're going to read everything. They're going to go over everything and then go back to the Quran, the last thing to do. So there was a process probably of trying to interpret the Quran, reshape the Quran, dwarf some of the very revolutionary rulings of the Quran so they can fit the time of those who interpreted the Quran at first, first generations. They did an amazing job. I don't want to demonize what they did. It was perfect for their times. But now as a scholars 
as, as adherents of the faith, imams and the clergy, in a, people in academia, everyone responsible should be doing what they did, should, should continue reading it. Now, out of the many ways uh, some did, probably uh, with good faith, unintentionally, right, uh, to reread the Quran, to make sense of it, is providing, I would say, entertaining books of tafsir. By entertaining, I mean providing details, a lot of details. Where they borrow the, these details from, many times it's biblical narratives, right? Uh, and this is named uh, the, the uh, uh, dominance of the al-Israeliyat, al al-Israeliyat. Many times, because the Quran has a minimalist approach to stories. This is not a secret. Everyone knows that. Many times the Quran will drop names of people in the stories, right? Uh, many times it's going to drop dates. They're not there at all, right? Uh, names of places. So what you need is the moral, the general moral guidance and ethical guidance. It's not the juicy details. Now, some exegetes wanted to provide more entertaining, juicy details for their readers. They went to the Bible and some of, not only going to the Bible, it's the, the narratives that were circulating at the time. So they kept adding, they kept borrowing. The result is for sure, you know, I'll give them credit for that more entertaining stories. We have more details, but some of the, these details were dangerous. They killed the core of the story itself. Let, let me give you an example. Examples explain. The story of the fall of Adam or the first act of disobedience, right? And I'm very careful in referring to this story because in, in my second book, this is a different thing, the, 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 the first garden that Adam and Eve had to live was an earthly garden. They never dwelled in heaven. It's not a heavenly garden. It's an earthly garden. This is another issue. But they committed together an act of disobedience and as a punishment, they were asked to leave that, let's say, five-star hotel or, or the, the perfect place they were at, right? Now, borrowing from biblical stories made some exegetes borrow the bad and the good alike. And when we say borrowing from al Iliad, let's remember that at their time, they didn't have the uh, strict uh, citation, you know, citation system. So these details were borrowed immediately introduced as the same fabric of what they were saying. So readers, audience won't be able to distinguish, are we still reading what the Quran says about the story or is it something else, right? Everyone thought it's, it's the, just the same, the, the, the Quranic story. Now the biblical narrative is different because in the Quran, what we see is Adam and Eve disobeying God together as a team and repenting together as a team but the first person who started with it was Adam. She was not Eve, right? What we see now, what, the story that made its way to, uh, uh, to, to the public and to the tradition and to mainstream Islam until recently we started questioning that was the opposite, was the biblical narrative, right? Mm -hmm. It was Eve who started the conversation with Satan or, or with, with, with Iblis first, right? I'm sorry, with Satan, we need to be a little bit accurate here first. And then she went to Adam and she tried to seduce Adam and you know the rest of the story. So it was Eve who was blamed and demonized as the one who brought evil to the world. This is not the Quranic story. This is just an innocent outcome of borrowing too much biblical details and adding them without citation to the uh, body of the Quranic story. Right. And this is only one example. Like so many other examples, you will see by adding too many details, you, you lost the, the moral that the story was trying to, to argue for. And this is one of the earliest reason I uh, provide in my book for this gap that now we see between what the Quran really says and the, the few views that made their, their way to mainstream Islam. And in, in terms of that sort of excessive narrativization and, and use of external sources, another interpretive deficiency you identify is what you believe is the use of hadith mm. to, to weaken and undermine the Quranic text. Um, how do you think this developed historically? 
Yeah, this is very true. And there are so many other reasons I try in my book just to identify some of them. Maybe other scholars can identify more or more of them. When it comes to using hadith to nullify the Quranic message, this is what we get misinterpreted on the most, right? Those people don't like hadith. They don't follow the prophet, all of that. We go in deep into rethinking hadith out of love to the prophetic. Uh, uh, you know, legacy and his 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 uh, life story, right? So the problem with hadith, the hadith was written later on, later on. There is a historical gap between the time when the Quran was written down and between the hadith what was written down. Let's also remember that since day one after uh, Prophet Muhammad passed, passed away, we had a bloody political conflict. And everyone, all conflicting parties, everyone wanted to claim the right to authority via claiming a religious right, right? So man manipulating some hadith, uh, changing some hadith, fabricating some hadith took place then. And therefore, today, we need to be careful with that approach. And that approach is not, you know hasty generalization it's not black or white we either accept all hadith or we reject all hadith it's be careful with specific types of hadith and i mean by that hadith that contradicts the quran someone would ask is there anything like a hadith that contradicts the quran there are many hadith that deactivates the quranic message and you, then you have to, to to stop to think that and are we the first to do that no absolutely not I'll give you an example, Al-Bukhari, Imam Al-Bukhari, right? He gets to be idealized today as the, the, the perfect person on narrating hadith and Sahih Al-Bukhari. Uh, some say it's the best book after the Quran. You know, it, it turned into this big leg legacy. What was Al-Bukhari's life project? In, in, uh, the, like his, his main project was what we're arguing today for, for today. Sifting hadith, rethinking hadith, going back checking what sound what we should reject or sometimes accept but give it you know be careful while accepting it let's remember that al-bukhari ended up out of uh, 160 thousand uh, 160 uh, thousand hadith he accepted only 4000 hadith right he rejected a lot of hadith so that lets and, you know just how much fabrication was going on at that time. Exactly. exactly. And this is one human being, a single project. He did all of that by himself, right? Out of his huge concern that there was a problem back then. And now I imagine if Al-Bukhari now see the way we just, you know, uh, stopped his project. Would he be proud of us or would he appreciate more people doing what he did? And go back to think and rethink what what do we have? What are the messages that we have in some circulate, circulated hadith? Because if we know for sure that this hadith was said by the prophet, then it's not a problem. But I'll tell you something. If a hadith contradicts the Quran, then probably it was not said by the prophet. There's a big chance that it was fabricated by someone. And let's remember that some of the aspects in Sira Maghazi, uh, hadith were written by the prophet's enemies, by the prophet's enemies themselves, right? Mm. For example, when I see all this huge uh, humanitarian uh, uh, message in the Quran, when the, I see this endorsement in the Quran of the freedom of belief, of the freedom of expression, la ikraha fi deen, uh, there is no compulsion in religion, right? And I go to one hadith, and I see the Prophet saying, Man one who changes his religion, kill him. Do you think this is this is this this fits the spirit of the Quran? The rest of there must be a problem in that one single hadith that we need to, to think about. So using some hadith to uh, de 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 uh, uh, um, decrease, I would say, or narrow down the progressive message of the Quran was another way. Uh, to to manipulating some of the uh, pioneer meanings in the Quran. One of one thing that comes up a lot when dealing with sort of more feminist tafsir projects is that the common criticism is that 
the, the scholars involved don't have a sort of systematic or very consistent relationship with the Hadith tradition. Um, there's always the word cherry picking uh, brought up, etc. So do, do you think it's possible for a sort of gender egalitarian tafsir project to develop a systematic and consistent relationship with the Hadith tradition? And can you clarify whether you feel like you have developed a, a specific scholarly approach? I mean, you mentioned this idea of, of, of checking against the Quran, but is there anything else beyond that? Yeah, yeah. Your concern is very valid. I totally agree with you. I have the same concern. Now, here is what happens. Uh, cherry picking, right? This is the key, which, what you mentioned. Uh, many feminists, when they go to hadith, uh, what they do, they choose what fits a more bright image for Muslim women. And they just try to, to ignore some of the less progressive aspects or aspects in Hadith or Sira or Maghazi or aspects in the tradition that would uh, contradict the, the, the picture or the image they're trying to draw, right? I don't like that. Uh, as a researcher, I don't like that. So what I did in my book, and actually in my three books, and it's working perfect, um, and in all my papers, I adopt a very strict tafsir al-Quran bil quran interpreting the Quran by the Quran methodology. I use nothing but the Quran. I'm not against people, you know, adopting other methodologies, right? I'm not against that. But personally, I want to be consistent. I don't want to go pick and choose the hadith I like, and then I go and just try to, you know, it's not there, pretend it's not there, because people can Google what you say the minute you're saying it, even your students can do that. Now there's democracy in, in sharing knowledge. All the manuscripts are uh, just, you know, click one button and, and you find everything. So it's not that you're hiding some information, they're gonna be hidden forever. It's accessible for everyone, right? My consistent methodology is just use the Quran, go to the Quran. Uh, is there inconsistencies in the Quran? Never, ever. I never found anything that I would, uh, you know, say it's causing me problems there and I need to hide that part of the Quran for any reason. Uh, again, I'm using another example. I like examples. They, they you know, explain everything in a beautiful way uh, for even uh, people who are going to be uh, watching this. Uh, for example, probably you've heard this million times. Many quote um, some details from the story of Khadija, right? The first wife of Prophet Muhammad. And they brag about Khadija. Uh, she's uh, a, a, a businesswoman. She was his boss. He, she hired him before she, she became she, his, his wife. She was uh, brave enough to even propose for Prophet Muhammad and all of that, right? Which is all beautiful, right? And you're borrowing these details, beautiful details from the tradition. But how about then the story of Sauda, Sauda bin Zama? I'm, I'm not sure if, if many people are familiar, uh, another wife of the Prophet with what the tradition says about her. According to the tradition, and please go check what I'm saying in the books of tradition, right? That out of aging, only out of aging, the prophet wanted to divorce her. She had to beg him to stay his wife. And she had to give up her right to intimacy with him. And she said, I'm going to give my day for Aisha, the young, the youngest one, right? And, and of course, they're not saying it this way. They wrap it in a beautiful way. The prophet was very merciful. He allowed to keep her as a wife. Okay, it's her right to stay as his wife. And no one has the right to divorce someone out of aging she did nothing wrong for him to attempt according to the tradition right which we need to be very careful in approaching he attempted to divorce her just out of aging right only one imam Ahmed al-Wa'ili I heard him in a YouTube video out of the so many resources I went to he said this is harshness the prophet won't say something like that right so uh, this is one example of borrowing some aspects from the tradition and just dropping the other aspects. Therefore, personally, and again, this is not a role model for, for everyone. I'm a researcher. I don't uh, support and I don't go with apologetic arguments for faith, right? This is not something I adopt or, or, or encourage. Therefore, when I use only the Quran to, to interpret the Quran, I find myself it's a shortcut 
to what is convincing for me and and for others and and do you, do you ever differentiate in your work between sunnah and hadith is that is that a distinction that you've ever made uh, the hadith is the saying said by the prophet sunnah is a little bit you know everything said now about the prophet the encounter with the prophet i'm careful with both I'm careful with both. I'm very strict. When I say the Quran, it's it's the Quran, right? That's I, I'm I'm not saying that I don't uh, go to other references to academic books to to or to books of tafsir. I go, uh, but I go to rethink them. What I take only as a historical, trustworthy document uh, is the the Quran. Is the Quran, and even for those who would say, why the Quran? Even, you know, our, our modern scientific findings uh, would support that the Quran probably, you know, and I, I, I mean by that uh, carbon dating, you know, uh, new findings in, in archaeology will support that the Quran probably was written down during the, the, the time, the lifetime of the Prophet himself. I know in the tradition there is two arguments, some of them saying that the companions uh, know it by by heart and they started writing it down only 20 years after the death of the prophet there is another less known argument which says that kutab al wahi and we know in the tradition there were people known as the writers of revel revelation uh, they started writing down and they wrote it down during the life of the prophet himself very interesting um another interpretive deficiency that you identify is what you call the male addressee fallacy. Um, what is the male addressee fallacy? That's a very new uh, term for myself. And how did it develop and how has it relied on the marginalization of female scholarship historically? Yeah, thank you, Tiran, for your question. I, I actually have now a paper that hopefully on this specific topic is coming with Al Mahdi Institute in, in, in Britain, inshallah, very soon. Uh, I expand on what I started in this book, and I argue that many times when you is used in the Quran, a book interpreted by majority of like, male dominance on interpreting the Quran, all Mufassirin well men, right? So it, it, it sounded natural to them that this book was revealed to them. Every time you is used in the Quran, it's interpreted one way, one narrow way, as if addressing only husbands or a community uh, of, of just the male community, right? Which mm -hmm. is not the case. I apply this general um, rule to three very problematic verses, uh, 434, right? Yes. And uh, 4, 6, and 43. 43, which deals with polygamy, uh, and uh, 46, which deals with uh, ending uh, the myth that the Quran encourages minor marriage, and 434, which ends uh, the myth also, the misunderstanding that the Quran endorses domestic violence or encourages husbands to beat their wives in cases of marital uh, conflict. Now, if we go to the three to the three uh, verses, if we go to, for example, to uh, four six and four three, we need to go a little bit back to where the uh, dialogue starts, and we see it's addressing Ya Yuhannas, O people, right? When we go to four thirty four, when we go to four twenty nine, we see it's addressing the community of believers, Ya Yuhaladina Amanu. Let's start from there, right? I'm not gonna go over the whole argument, but just to answer your question. So the dialogue then is not addressing husbands, it's addressing the community, both male and female, men and women with legal, I would say, rulings or suggestions. So it's the community's responsibility altogether to rethink what is said in that verse. Um, I'm getting probably ahead of myself, but to tell you the, the, the outcome of the investigation so when it comes, for example, to a ta'adud or polygamy, what is the outcome of saying that it's addressed the permissibility of polygamy, the highly conditional permissibility? What's the outcome, Abla, of saying it's addressed to the community, not to husbands? Because now it's not husbands who decide when it's permissible or not. It's the community. It's the courts, congregations. There should be a court permission. 
there should be a, a, a law, right? It's not husbands individually going and saying, I see there is a need or a permissibility for me to seek another wife. No, it's not you. The same uh, comes when it comes to 4-6. What is the right age for, um, or the sound age, or the earliest age we can go with with cases of marriage? 4-6 says, وَبْتَلُوا الْيَتَامَ حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغُوا النِّكَاحِ فَإِنْ آنَسْتُ مِنْهُمْ رُشْدًا فَادْفَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ And it, it addresses uh, the need to protect orphans' monies, money and not to allow them uh, to, you know, have the responsibility of, of dealing with their money, taking care of their money until they reach what the verse uh, names as the, the marriageable age. The same verse will will tell us what is the marriageable age according to the Quran. It says, If you see that they have now sound judgment, right? Sound judgment. What does that mean? It means unless someone reaches the age of sound judgment, right? Unless they're adults, they're not, they, they never reach a marriageable age, which means the Quran is against minor marriage. And this is going back to your question, Roxana. This is another contradiction with, with, with Sunnah, which claims that Prophet Muhammad married Aisha when she was like nine years old. And it started with the, the conversation about her marriage started when she was as, as young as six years old, right? This is not correct. This goes against four, six in the Quran. Now, so it sounds like puberty is not equated with adulthood. No, at all in the Quran, at all. At all, and I have a whole a full section on that in the book because there are other some less problematic verses about that. But I argue that four six make it very clear. It's rational the age of making sound judgments, and the Quran leave leave it loose. By the way, you know now um, it's it's in Nebraska, nineteen years old, right? Uh, I I don't know in other states or other countries. It's it's up to people to decide when people become legally responsible for their decisions and the quran goes with that for marriage now going back to the to the argument that why is it important to say it's addressed to people not to husbands again when you address it to people to the community both men and women it means we need kind of a law right explaining that this is the marriageable age right ending with 434 saying that it's addressed also to the community, not to husbands. And by the way, it has nothing to do with beating wives. It is beating, but it's beating criminals, criminals, female criminals. Again, when we take the conversation, we say it's not addressed to men, it's addressed to the community. It means the community decides how to deal with female criminals and it escalates from warning to house arrest, to beating when nothing else works according to the Quran. It has nothing to do with marriage. But again, putting everything together, this is what I call the male addressee fallacy. Every time there is a verse saying you starting a conversation with the community, it's uh, interpreted or misinterpreted one way, addressing husbands or addressing me. And has the doctrine of abrogation affected the interpretation of Quranic pa passages uh, relating to women um, in, in combination with the male addressee uh, fallacy? Absolutely. Absolutely. A big yes. A big yes. Because what is abrogation, right? Abrogation is a human, I would say, unauthorized human interaction with the sacred text. We need all to interact with the text. We need to read the text. We need to understand the text. Even if you go to this imam and that imam and this sheikh and that sheikh and try to, uh, you know, seek guidance from them, which is which is a good thing to do, you still need to cross, to read this Quran and make sense of it. But abrogation is some human saying that these verses are deactivated by other verses. Tell me where the Quran says what verse abrogates what verse. If it's in the Quran, I'm okay with that. So let's, because it's a human, it's, it's a divine book, right? Well, I'm assuming it should be perfect and well-edited book, but a human's editing it, right? And not in a good way, just to activ activate some of the very 
um, advanced uh, rulings in the Quran. This is um, tampering with the text, trying to change things in the text, again, by humans. Uh, in the Quran, yes, there is a verse which says, and some use it as an evidence this is talking about abrogation uh, there is no no ayah we we abrogate or make people forget we we can something um, loose translation uh, we can bring something like it or better than it let's remember that ayah ayah could be a miracle and could be verse mm. ayah means miracle and i argue like so many others that the quran is, is arguing there that because miracles come and go we know that right so some miracles we can abrogate miracles the quran is saying we can bring better miracles but mm. the quran is not saying we abrogate abrogate verses verses are not randomly you know just revealed out of mistake so god changes his mind about them i'm okay if God, you know, Astaghfirullah changes his mind about verses in the revelation, he should tell us in another revelation, in another verse, hey, forget this verse, you know, I have something better here. You know, this is a little bit, even from the way I'm explaining it, you can tell there is something fishy with the whole argument. So the argument of abrogation saying that there are some verses in the Quran, but you forget about them, just recite them, you, you don't need really to, to take them seriously. Or the opposite, which is worse, to say that there are verses you don't find anymore in the Quran, but the ruling should stay forever. And I have, inshallah, a paper coming soon uh, with Munster University, pub, uh, based on a, a, a conference we had in Munster University in Germany, uh, which deals with uh, an assumed abrog abrogated verse, which is the verse of stoning, right? Uh, the elderly, uh, even the translation of it is, is funny. The elderly, male and female, if they fornicate, stone them. Uh, do we have it in the Quran? No, it's not in the Quran. Again, it's the abrogation fallacy or um, this exegetical shortcoming. According to the tradition, there was a verse that argued that for married men and women, in case of publicly witnessed fornication, their uh, punishment is stoning to death, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the ruling is still adopted in the tradition based on alleged, fabricated, uh, abrogated one verse which we can't find any place and anywhere in the Quran today. And in this paper, I argue for 20 arguments uh, that this verse can never fit the Quran because it uh, contradicts when it comes to the language, the style, so many observations, it contradicts the, the rest of the Quran. What do we see in the Quran about fornication, even publicly witnessed fornication? We see hundred lashes, that's it, the end of the story, hundred lashes. And it applies with no distinction whatsoever to married and unmarried, you know, uh, adulterers, right? Mm -hmm. But we see the tradition, again, the dominance of Israeliyat went back to something that was found in the pre-Islamic Arabia and said, people in the tradition, no, 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 100 lashes is not enough. We need more. But it's not in, 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 in your book. It's not there. And even that missing verse, can't fit, can't be a missing verse. How do I do that in this paper? I use the rest of the Quran, the style of it, the language of it, uh, uh, to uh, uh, see if this single verse can fit in it or not. And the big answer is no, it doesn't fit the rest of it. So this is abrogation. And uh, this is only some aspects of how problematic abrogation can get. Yeah, I understand that we can't get too deep into it. But, exactly, exactly. But even when I became interested into it, in, in it, when it was brought to my attention, 
uh, and I just read the Wikipedia page on it. I thought it was mind boggling. Just yeah. the simple fact that we don't know how many verses have been abrogated anywhere from five to, I heard up to 200 verses. Right. Um, and so, right. yeah, it's a total mess. With uh, no authorization whatsoever, right? With no authorization. It's people claiming that you don't need to pay attention to these verses anymore. If right. it's within the Quran, that's totally fine. But to say that humans can now edit the Quran, I have a problem with that. Right. Uh, another argument in your book is the authoritative ascendancy of early religious scholars continue to play a key role in this marginalization of women and the role in the Quran. How can you challenge the ascription of sanctity of these early views and argue that pre-modern scholars did not necessarily understand the revealed text better than modern scholars today? Yeah, and I'm going to be trying to provide maybe a short answer for this one, since my answers for the other questions are very long and I'm concerned about uh, your time. Um, uh, my time is okay. <laughs> um, so we have this habit this bad habit until today. Unless you say a view, an opinion, a fatwa, and then you go back in history and you find someone who said that, people won't take you seriously, right? Mm. But here's the thing. Who said that the right to think the Quran, understand the Quran, implement the Quran, was limited to the few centuries that followed the revelation of the Quran? What are we supposed to do? Just to recite, you know, without... Uh, making any sense of the Quran, or just rely on the human efforts of great scholars. I agree with you, but they did their part and we still need to do what they did. We still need to follow on their steps. They, we're gonna make them more proud if we do that. But what happens today, uh, this is bid'a. This is innovation. This is something new. You can't cite anyone saying that before. Now, the interaction between the divine text and, and the human understanding is eternal. This is the reason why this was revealed in the first place. So you interact with it. You make sense of it. So it shouldn't be arrested. It should, shouldn't stop, right? Unfortunately, what do we have in the tradition? The doors of Ijtihad, rational, independent, rational reasoning, were closed since the 10th century. And what are we supposed to do now? Just... Uh, recycle previous uh, um, uh, ideas, they worked for their times because they were produced during their times. And the Quran allows that. It's the, the generality implemented in the Quran that allows for the terms to be interpreted and reinterpreted according to your times and needs. Otherwise, I mean by that narrowing and locking the Quranic language in the needs of the seventh century doesn't make it an eternal book, doesn't make Islam a religion that could work for, and this is this is the 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 the, the, the huge premise of, of, of Islam. It's a universal religion. No one would argue seriously that it's it's a religion that worked only for the people in Mecca and pre-Islamic Arabia, seventh century, and that's all, right? But now how can you make sense of the two arguments. You're, you're limiting us to readings, early readings of the Quran, and you want to say that the Quran is valid, Islam is, is valid for all communities, all times, all, all people. And to give you an example, I argue for my book for uh, the prophethood of, of Mary, Mary according to the Quran, uh, we can conclude from the logical reading, log logical evidence, and from linguistic uh, evidence that the Quran refers to her as a prophet, not a messenger, not a messenger. She was not sent with a message to her people, but she was a prophet, right? Now, from my personal experience, no one, no one takes you seriously until you say, hey, Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi and al-Imam al-Qurtubi argued for Mary as a prophet. Then they can start, really? Tell, I, tell I have more. to. I have to, you know, I have to add when I first came across that in your book, I thought, you know, wow, she's kind of going into deep water right here. <laughs> but then you were able to substantiate it with um, the, the work of classical scholars who also exactly. shared in that same exactly. opinion. And exactly. that's just a testimony to how vast 
you know, our heritage or tradition is when it comes to any given matter. Um, it just totally blew my mind when I came across that. Yeah, and a few people know that Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi and al-Qurtubi argued for not only Mary, but the mother of Isaac and the mother of Moses, as well as prophets. They they argued they, re, they received revelations telling them what to do. So we should argue for them as prophets. Mm. But again, these isolated views, again, the dominance of patriarchy, these isolated views were just tolerated by the rest of, of the Mufassirin, and today by traditionalists, just tolerated their existence without highlighting them. But they didn't throw them out of Islam. They didn't write any disparity. Uh, I don't think they took them seriously enough. Okay. Uh, you're, you're, you're cute. You can argue whatever you want. You know, we're not we're not going to go against you, but we're not going to adopt it. OK. In terms of sort of antagonistic perceptions in traditional Islamic scholarship towards um, what is often sometimes perceived as sort of Western oriented scholarship, th this is this is a, a phenomena that we we've seen for quite a few years now, particularly post colonialism, um, uh, and seems to be a particularly hot topic whenever we discuss progressive readings of the Quran nowadays. What are your what is your view of the sort of historical roots of this phenomenon in particular? And how did sort of a close relationship, um, a sort of conceptual relationship develop for Muslims between female emancipation and colonialism? And, and what can we do to sort of disentangle this association in order to legitimize the voice of Muslim female scholars in our contemporary climate? Yeah, uh, there is there is a post-colonial reaction that we can't deny, right? Mm. Uh, many times when uh, you argue for gender egalitarianism or even worse feminism, it's viewed as wholly, you know, fully uh, Western ideas that we have nothing to do with. Those values are imposed on us. Uh, we need to uh, to be very uh, careful and suspicious about even trying to accept them. Who said that universal humanitarian values are Western values? Now, the connotation comes from a long history of colonialism. Uh, the colonialist project was based in a way or another on using bright titles, advocating for democracy, for liberating women in the Arab world, the, the poor veiled women, right? We need to liberate them, not within their culture, we need to liberate them from their culture. Until you give up on your culture, we can't help you. The mm -hmm. reaction now in the Muslim world and in the Arab world, we don't want your values. It's a psychological connotation association between uh, the, I, I would say the hypocrisy of the Western world when they used and abused bright titles. But let's go back to the uh, original story. These are our values in the first place. These are values well rooted in the Quran. These are values well rooted in the tradition. The fact that we don't deny that the West, the colonial project, the imperialist project abused them doesn't make them own this these these values these are humanly shared values we have the right to these values as much as people in the west have these rights right so many times especially when you use the word feminism again i want to clarify this maybe i'm doing this for for the hundredth time now in, in one interview feminism when we use the term is not female centric studies female centric interest that goes against family system that goes against the stability of our families. No, it's gender egalitarianism. It's arguing that men and women are equal in the Quran and they should be treated equal in all aspects of Islam, uh, in theory and in the practice. Not only in, in theory, um, no reasonable person will tell you, no, men and women are not equal in the Quran. They will all tell you, yes. Okay, let's come to the to practicing that. And now we have problems, right? Because of the way the tradition processed so many views, we need to move forward with practice, which is normal, which is uh, positive, which applies to everything, including the way we um, uh, make sense of the Quran. Um, I'm, I'm 
it, this phenomenon is, is sometimes um, being fueled by Western ac academics themselves. So what mistakes do you think certain Western academics have made in the field of Quranic studies mm. and sort of worsened the mm. marginalization of gender egalitarian interpretation mm. of the Quran? Mm. And also even sort of reinforced the dominance of sort of pre-modern or classical Islamic readings over contemporary readings? Um, there is there is um, a huge marginalization of studies produced in the modern Arab and Islamic world, I would say, in Western academia. Uh, so the problem we can't go, and I mean by the problem, the gap in Quranic studies between uh, Western uh, produced uh, uh, books and, and articles and studies and between uh, or let's say, generally speaking, between the Muslim and the non-Muslim tradition, the Muslim and non-Muslim intellectual production, there is a gap, right? This gap first is, is it due to the suspicious attitude, right? This is the colonial West, as I explained. But also when it's, it comes to the West, they uh, they undervalue the production in the, in the modern Arab world and the Islamic world, and I can't see that. And this is not new. It goes back to Edward Said's huge groundbreaking book, Orientalism. He was the first to bring the attention that in the West, they changed the Orient, the Middle East into something to study including the culture, the religion, the people. So uh, it is the claim, if we can say, to intellectual superiority. Mm. We, we tell you what, what is Islam, right? And many times uh, there's the, the other huge problem, and now people are going to say, yeah, because she's a native speaker of Arabic, she can say that, is using translations only to finalize uh, uh, views to finalize a uh, revisionist approach to, to, to Islamic studies, right? Because if you, we all know there is a gap between the original text and the translation. Now, if you keep doing this for centuries, I depend on the translation of a translation of a translation, then no matter what I do or these translations are great, I'm losing the, the direct connection to the original text. Uh, so many, uh, researchers in the West, uh, they start with, uh, you know, scratching the surface of what the Quran says because they don't take Arabic seriously. And I, I know I'm a teacher of Arabic myself. Arabic, Arabic is hard. But to go into, and I'm going to give you an example without mentioning the name of that person, uh, to go into three years of studying Arabic and then to go into a project as huge as, as, huge as translating the Quran a little bit too much, right? Three, my students study three years. I want to go translate the Quran, you know, myself now. I don't, I don't feel I can translate the whole Quran. I, if I do that, it's going to take me forever along with other scholars. But for, you know, for the claim to, I studied the Quran for three years and now I'm going to translate the Quran for you a little bit too much. And I'm using this as an example to show you that uh, Arabic as the key to unlock some mysterious aspects in the Quran is underestimated in the West because many people just want to avoid the difficulties of dealing with Arabic. So this is one of the huge concerns I have. And, you know, I really didn't understand the magnificence of Arabic until I took two semesters of Arabic myself. Um, <laughs> and as you mentioned, it's a hard language. I feel like I'm not that inclined to learning languages anyway, but I did it for religious purposes to understand the Quran. Um, and yeah, you're really a slave to the translator and how they interpret certain words from Arabic into English or into whatever language, and you lose a lot through that. And if you just continuously from one person, okay, I'm going to take their translation, mm -hmm. I'm going to take the translation from that person who took the translation from that person, I can see how you really just don't get to the uh, meat and potatoes of the matter, as they say. Um, you know, that was just an excellent way that you absolutely have right. I totally agree with you in, in my class woman in the Quran, what I do, even for my students who don't speak Arabic, I always have the, the verse in Arabic, the verse in English, everything highlighted with the same, like red, red, green, green, the word and its translation. And there is something I noticed, which is very uh, serious that some translations were, were include interpretations 
or interpretive view within the translation that the non-native speaker will ever know that this is not part of the verse. The, the, the verse uh, for lashing, which I mentioned as a punishment for publicly witnessed fornication, uh, which is... Um, uh, the translation of it will add, will add the translation, the fornicator, male, female, and married, and married, to make it sound for the reader that this is exclusive to unmarried people as a punishment. But this is interpretive, one interpretive view that was included within it. For the non-native speaker, they will never able to say, no, this is there is something there, or it, it was added. So it so the the gaps between translation, interpretation, the original text can get, as you mentioned, very serious. And finally, what is the exegetical context sonomy fallacy, and how have you sought to overcome it with your own commentary? Yeah, it is a fancy long name, but the meaning of it very simple is just misquoting the Quran. It's taking parts. Uh, fragments of arguments, uh, parts of verses, and sell them to the public as if this is the meaning in this verse. And I'm going to give you uh, an example. And, and I argue that go back to the full full text, go back to the preceding and the following verses, start quoting from the beginning of the dialogue. I already mentioned the male uh, uh, addressee fallacy. If we go just, you know, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, go to, to, to the previous verses, you, you will get the meaning. Uh, I'll give you an, an example, a famous example. When people argue for polygamy, you hear them saying, marry those who please you. Uh, two, three, or four. This is an example of this fallacy because mm. it doesn't start with the command marry. It starts with, if you fear you won't be just to orphans, then marry and it will continue and then it will add another condition if you fear you won't be fair then then uh, limit yourself to one wife so it changes the uh, context from a conditional highly conditional double conditional permissibility only permissibility into a command marry those who please you three mm. two three or four right if only you continue you continue with the whole verse you will understand a totally different meaning we don't like when islamophobes do that right when they just take uh, the sword verse right kill them whenever you you find them islamophobes they they take this part and they generalize it. Look, this is what the Quran say. Okay, go read the full text. You will understand it. But the Islamic tradition is as guilty as Islamophobes when it comes to this, this exegetical shortcoming. Don't take part of the verse and generalize it as the meaning. And, and the, the example I gave you, I lost the count with how many imams, when they respond to questions on polygamy, they start, marry those who please you, and they start from that part. It, mm -hmm. it, it gets to a point, it's, it's almost annoying. Start from the beginning. It's a conditional sentence, right? I'm sorry to say that, guys. Everyone will hate me for this. Like, if I tell a student, if you attend the class, you do everything, you're going to get an A. If they go and say, Abla told us that we're going to get an A, would that be fair to what I say to them? No. Start with the conditional sentence first. It's going to change the meaning. So I know the, the, the term is fancy, but the, the, the meaning of it is, is very simple. Just be uh, honest in, in quoting the Quran. Thank you. Um, just to sort of get into sort of the, some of the, the sort of content of, of how you analyze certain verses. Verse, verse three, four is that you've already brought up has, has been described as sort of the single most important verse in regards to the Quranic depiction of the relationship between men and women. And in your book, you, you specifically pinpoint the misinterpretation of the term Kuwama within the verse by male dominated scholarship as sort of setting in motion a betrayal of Quranic egalitarian principles and a resurgence specifically of sort of pre-Islamic male chauvinism, um, which sort of 
ultimately led to quite a big exegetical gap between the Quran and its judicial application. Um, how is this term commonly interpreted in both sort of early and contemporary scholarship? How has it been used to assert sort of a gender-based male superiority? And what motivated so many interpreters to understand the verse as an assertion of male superiority of women? Um, and what sort of real life social consequences for Muslim women has been directly caused by this misinterpretation? Right. So the Quran was processed, interpreted and preached by men. Right. So there is a dominance of uh, the, the elite male as, as educators, as preachers, as imams. Um, they, they represented the authority on understanding the Quran. At the same time, it seemed natural to them. It was part of their uh, philosophy of life that men are better than women. They projected that on the Quran. So instead of responding to what the Quran is telling them, sharing with them, and according to the uh, Islamic tradition, the Quran are the exact uh, verbatim words of God revealed to Muhammad through angel Gabriel. So we're talking about a divine perspective on life, right? Did it work for them? Maybe couldn't understand the 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 different philosophy introduced to them. So as they assumed in a way or another that the Quran maybe is asserting what we know about life, that there is a gender-based superiority. Men are better in women. So they went into the Quran to justify their beliefs about life. So instead of responding to what the Quran says, they were projecting on the Quran what they believe the Quran should say. The concept of qawama is uh, the, the summary of all of that. Uh, so it's based on gender superiority. Men are better than women because they were created better than women, because they were favored by God, right? And therefore, it was translated into weird arguments, for example, limiting uh, women's right to education, lim limiting women's right to work. Uh, the guardianship of 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 uh, uh, the, the the male figure in in the family, right? Which is which is uh, the family system? I argue for the family system. We're not against that, but to say that someone is better than someone because of the way they're born uh, is as ugly as saying someone is better because uh, they're born rich and others are poor. They're born white and others are are, are black. They're born this way and that way. In the eyes of God, everyone are equal. Everyone are equal, including uh, all genders or, or including men and women. Uh, so the concepts, the old, the old pre-Islamic and even uh, early Islamic concept of uh, gender hierarchy uh, was validated by using the religion because it was the time when religious uh, arguments dominated everything. So people had in a way or another to justify their biases by using religion, including the Quran. And how does your interpretation of Kiwama agree or differ with other Muslim female exegetes like Dr. Amina Wadud? Uh, Dr. Amina Wadud is a pioneer in, in Islamic feminism. And while reading uh, 434, uh, I, uh, I followed her in, in, in her investigation uh, when she says, uh, I'm, I'm going to quote a little bit from the verse, men are qawamun over women, bima faddala allahu ba'dahum ala ba'd, wa bima anfaqu bin amwalihim. Do or in the way that uh, some of them are better or prefer to others and due to spending. Now, the huge linguistic observation Amina Wadud does is the following. بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ مَاسْكِلًا عَلَى بَعْض مَاسْكِلًا Right? So there is a preference in the verse, Amina Wadud says. But it's a preference made among men themselves because mm. Arabic is very accurate. We have tools to be very gender specific. Had it been the case that the Quran is favoring men to women as it was misunderstood in the tradition, the verse will read الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم masculine على بعضهن feminine which is not the case what we have is men 
are qawamu over women uh, in the way or uh, the Quran will explain God preferred some men to some others at because some men spent which means not all men are qawamu the no. best out of men are qawamu so there is a preference there there is a hierarchy there but men who consider qiwama and this will take us to the question what is qiwama right qiwama is a duty is not a gender based right you're not born qawam because you're born male you can make yourself qawam how you have high moral character bima faddala allah ba'dhum ala ba'd god chose some men over some other men and qiwama wa bima anfaqu it includes not only being the guardian not only taking care of everyone around you including your wife and everyone not limited to your wife right including also uh, considering spending and spending is not only spending on your wife we're not going to go back to gender based roles it's considering with with gifts i would say female figures in your family it could be uh, as a qawam as a good man if you want to be named qawam if you want to be rewarded divinely rewarded as a qawam if you want to be a, a role model as a muslim man you should consider gifts for moms sisters female figures and female figures in your family in addition to your wife in addition to your wife so qiwama is a rewardable rewardable a duty is not a right people are not born qawamu they make themselves qawamu very interesting sounds like something that a lot of men could aspire to and inshallah uh, Insha god willing um and sometimes qawama is understood as an exchange of women's obedience for men's financial support uh, why do you believe this to be problematic uh, what does this interpretation miss in its in, in in its understanding of the term and its grammatical context? Yeah, because exactly as you you soundly explained it, it's an exchange of obedience, right? Of obedience uh, versus spending, which is not uh, what the marital sacred relationship stands for, right? It's not that shallow. It's not that ugly. Uh, it's uh, uh, marriage in the Quran is described as a miracle from god it's mm -hmm. a gift from god to have a good spouse it can never be something like i spend and you obey me right you feel even from the way i'm explaining it it's a reduction to uh to something less than a spiritual uh miracle which is the way the quran refers to marriage and you know it seems like that's the direction a lot of, well not, I don't want to say a lot of people but within certain uh groups of people that that's the way that they want to understand marriage I'm taking care of everything so mm -hmm. you're supposed mm -hmm. to be obedient to me but like you said just on the outset that just sounds problematic and which explains why they get so much pushback from people when they try to characterize marriage as that kind of transaction yeah yeah material relationship shallow relationship and uh, i'm okay with how you want to view your marriage if you want to take it this way feel free to go with that good luck with that but here's my problem when people go and find divine justification for their ill choices then there is a problem so even if if some cultures let's say i know this sounds very mean if some cultures is normal for them you know to go with uh i know it's ugly to say that beating their wives okay if this is your choice and you're happy with that good luck with that okay i won't endorse that but good luck with that but don't say this is a commandment from god this is an advice from god this is what the quran say now i will have problem with you because now you're not only taking your own ill choice in life now you're hijacking the legacy of all muslims and and the the most important book for all muslims around the world speak for yourself not on behalf of others our sacred book doesn't say that if this is your choice go with that but don't say it's god's choice and how does the interpretation of quran chapter 2 verse 228 factor mm -hmm. into your interpretation of kiwama in verse 4 or chapter 4 verse 3 uh, 34 uh, what is your understanding of 2 uh, 228 okay uh, so to, 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 to uh, address your questions, 
uh, I need to explain what I mean by, uh, by Qiwama in, in 434. Uh, so Qiwama is a rewardable duty. The Quran confirms that men and, and women are, are equal. They're equal in uh, their, their responsibilities, their duties, and in the divine rewarding system, right? Qiwama is a rewardable duty. Men can be rewarded by God for spending the same that some other uh, duties or things that, I'm not going to call it the duties, things women go through are specific to them. Let me give you an example. Women go through labor, right? It's rewarded by God. It's specific to women, right? Uh, men who want to make role models for other Muslim women should consider qiwam, right? Uh, now, the, the problem with the two verses you mentioned is the concept of, I believe this is what makes you ask, ask the question, is the concept of new shoes, right? Mm. In 434, people think it's it should be related to the marital context. I argue that 434 doesn't stand or has nothing to do with marital context. What is 434 then? 434 is the three methods just explained in the Quran to deal with females on the community who violate laws, right? How do we know that? It starts from 429. The whole thing, the whole dialogue is addressed, Ya Ayuhayladina Amanu, the community of believers, both men and women. The, the whole verse, 434, doesn't mention wives once, husbands once, marriage once, all these terms. We have a rijal. Arijal means mean men. Qawamuna ala nisa. And nisa means uh, women, right? Even the concept of nishuz. Nishuz is uh, generalized in the tradition to mean marital disobedience. Mm. But it's a sub uh, category of violating laws. In the Quran, it goes, when qila lakum in shizu fan shizu. If it say to you, stand up, stand up. It's a behavior, so Nishuz stands for a behavior that is different from what others do. So 434 is saying that women who commit Nishuz, right, who violate laws, uh, can be subject to one of the three things. It says, those who you fear, they might commit Nishuz. Uh, talk to them, which stands for warning while uh, reproaching, talking, giving warning, and I translated as court warnings, and the Quran doesn't uh, hear, it's a general language, doesn't tell how many times it could be repeated. It depends on authorities um, until it works, until what is proven to be, to be working. It explains from اِحْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ it's uh, interpreted in a metaphoric way to mean withholding sex, right? Maja is a noun place, like masbah. It's a, a, a name for a noun where things took place. Daja uh, or maja, it's where you lay down. Lock them, leave them in their bedrooms or in their houses, which at the time, at the time used to be one bedroom. So it escalates then from warnings to house arrest. Escalates when nothing works, adribuhunna. So there is this possibility of dealing with female criminals in the society when nothing else works with the possibility of a uh, physical discipline. But this is a, a language that we're using with criminals and violators of laws. This is conditions by how courts and authorities and congregations will do them. This is not something performed by angry husbands. Now, there is a still to the argument for 434. I can come back to it. I know it's, uh, it's very problematic for people to change centuries of thinking a verse a certain way and to tell them, no, there's a whole different a new meaning for it. But because you mentioned uh, the, the other verse where Nushuz is mentioned, the other verse, وَإِنَ مْرَأَةٌ خَافَتْ مِنْ بَعْلِهَا نُشُوزًا أَوْ إِعْرَاضًا فَلَا جُنَحَ عَلَيْهِمَا أَنْ يُسْلِحَ بَيْنَهُمَا صُلْحًا It's different. Now we have نُشُوز as marital context. If a woman, let me translate, if a woman fears from her husband نُشُوز, 
the shoes or alienation, then there is no blame on both of them to seek reconciliation. Now, this verse is different because I have literally a woman fearing from her husband. So I have the word husband, Baal, right? So it's different. It is Nishuz that holds the meaning of marital context, which we don't have in 434. Do you want me to go a little bit and explain the full thing about 434? Because I know many people will have questions about this or we hold on. No, no, well, I, one thing I wanted to ask before you sort of go into your your particular interpretation and the, yes. the, the evidence you have for your interpretation, your interpretation is quite unique, both in terms of sort of obviously in comparison to early mm. this kind of classical, it's just, and even contemporary exegesis as well. And you've discussed in your book how um, there there be numerous attempts by sort of early and modern interpreters of the Quran to, to soften the meaning of 434 mm, to, mm. because it, obviously like a, the, the majority interpretation is that it is granted permission under certain conditions to strike one's wife but everybody has tried to soften the meaning even the early classical scholars tried to soften this meaning so so what interpretive maneuvers have have they employed from the early to the modern day and why do you find those insufficient Yes. So from the beginning, probably today of our conversation, I said as a researcher, I don't support and I don't go with apologetic arguments. Mm -hmm. I know many people found in uh, the uh, assumed interpretation, assumed to be correct, that God is uh, providing Muslim men a license to beat their wives, right? They found it very embarrassing. And many people, especially among modern voices, they try to rethink it, which we should thank them for. But my concern is playing linguistic maneuvers to end with the results we want to extract from the Quran. The Quran is way better than that. We don't need to do that. If we we think something, read, read something in the Quran, and we think it's embarrassing, it's our misinterpretation of it, it's not the Quran itself. And 434 is a clear example of that. So you mentioned attempts made by some scholars to soften the language. Many played uh, linguistic uh, tricks. They said Daraba, Daraba doesn't stand for beating or for physical display in the first place. Daraba could mean so many meanings. I would say yes. But when Daraba, Fadribuhunna, in this context is conjugated, to address, right, to address a mixed community or a community of, of men, because we have wow, with idribuhunna to beat an absent or uh, a, 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 a plural, feminine plural, and is not followed by any preposition. So it's not darabaan, it's idribuhunna fla. It means uh, hate to them. I'm sorry to say that. So trying to say it doesn't mean what you think it means is not working. We all know the Arabic stands for beating them. But the, the solution to the verse is within the verse, as I argue. It's beating, but not beating wives. It has nothing to do with wives. As I mentioned, the verse doesn't mention once the word wife or husband. It's addressed in 429 to the community of believers. And it is the three correction methods. The other way I can recall for arguing for another meaning to Daraba is leave women, just leave them. Ignore them, leave them. And first of all, that will need a preposition, which is missing. This is number one. Number two, what kind of advice is this when it comes to marital context? So if a man comes to me, and let's, let's imagine the opposite. If a man comes to me and he says, I have a problem with my wife, and I go, just leave her. Would that count as a good marriage? If I'm a marriage counselor and say, just leave, what leave her? Like uh, like divorce her? Just uh, uh, ignore her? What, what, what is it as an advice? Again, people are trying, we're trying to get out of the embarrassing meaning by all means. So they argued for that, right? Uh, it won't work even as a good advice, right? The other thing, Many people try to argue for daraba as not standing for marital uh, violence. What about withholding th sex then? 
Because again, according to the traditional interpretation, the second step a man can uh, uh, think of as a way to deal with his with his rebellious wife, first, talk to her. Second, and before beating takes place, according to the traditional narrative, is withholding sex. Withholding sex is a psychological abuse in marriage. Who would give that as a good advice? Would it help if I say to a man, to a woman to do, to do the same with her husband? According to the tradition, if a woman says no, she's going to be cursed by, her, by, by angels until the morning. So there's a bias reading of, of, of it, right? Uh, the other thing with holding six is not supported in the Quran. Uh, how do we know? The Quran prohibited al-dihar. And al-dihar was a pre-Islamic pre marital uh, punishment. According to al-dihar, a man could harass his wife psychologically by threatening her that he's going to withhold intimacy. And they used to say something like, Anti ummi. To me, you're like the back of my mother. The mm -hmm. Quran prohibited even saying it, let alone doing it. And according to the Quran, the strict punishment for any man who threatens his wife with the heart, he can't go back to her as a wife and a husband until he sits a slave free or he fasts for two months without posing, without taking a rest, which mm -hmm. means verbal abuse, psychological abuse in marriage is not a joke in the Quran. So how could the Quran, these are inconsistencies within the Quran, right? And therefore we have a reason to argue against the traditional interpretation of 434. The Quran can never ever, because of logical inconsistencies, argue that men can beat their wives or that men can withhold sex as a punishment for their disobedient wives, right? Uh, it's uh, three, as I argued, three uh, punishments uh, recommended for communities, for congregations to adopt, to deal with female criminals. Uh, the, the last question will be why female criminals, right? Uh, we know according to the time and any time women are, uh, could be um, uh, victims of uh, harassment, right? Uh, victims of uh, uh, mistreatment. I, I, as I see it, the Quran prioritizes all minorities, right? The Quran, it's clear in prioritizing orphans, the elderly, and the, the, the advantage of women. Female criminals could be, if just merged like any other category with others, could be wronged. Therefore, saving their dignity, the Quran recommended these three options to deal with female criminals. You talk to them, you send them warnings, house arrest. Until today, some women in some countries, when they're sent to a prison, their reputation is smeared forever, even after they're done with their sentence and when they come back to their homes. The Quran is suggesting house arrest in a state and escalates to, to beating. The, Quran, the, the Prophet himself never uh, known to have beaten any of his wives. So this is another reason that we should argue against beating. Uh, the Quran commands in 419, deal with them according to what is known to be nice uh, uh, and, and, and kind. And my question is beating uh, kind or, or nice? The Quran would be in short contradicting itself if 434 stands for beating wives. Let me end with this. And you know, I'm glad that you brought up the fact that the prophet never employed this type of punishment on his wife and that's something on his wives. And that's something that I've always heard traditionists when talking about this verse uh, acknowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the same sit, well, not in the same sitting, but I know they also have the same understanding of the uh, hadith from his wife Aisha that the prophet was the walking Quran basically exactly. that everything from the Quran is what the prophet did um, and you know how do you reconcile that that everything the prophet did it was the Quran but then okay this aspect of the Quran he never employed yeah. you yeah. know <laughs> exactly. it just seems mind-boggling 
So the prophet will be violating his own message if he recommended to his companions, this is what you do with your wives and he never, you know, live so. up to what he preached. So right. there's another reason to uh, uh, reject the traditional understanding of 434. Uh, and uh, you also say in your book that apart from 434, all of the misinterpretations we find in the way the teachings of the Quran have been interpreted and practiced, nothing exceeds the topic of polygyny and the way in which it has been wrongly understood and adopted by Muslim jurists. You distinguish between what you refer to as Quranic polygyny and Islamic polygyny, with the latter ignoring the Quran's radical reformation of the concept of polygyny and instead justifying a new system of polygyny that was similar to the obsolete pre-Islamic form. So how was polygyny practiced pre-Islam and what is the difference between Islamic polygyny and Quranic polygyny? Uh, you're very correct. I make a distinction in my book between Quranic uh, polygamy and, and uh, Islamic polygamy. And even in, in all Islamic teachings, uh, there is a difference between what we see in the Quran and what uh, made its way to mainstream Islam. Even in uh, naming, developing and naming my, my class, which I teach every year, uh, I call it woman in the Quran. I don't call it woman in Islam. Because mm. when you go to the Quran, what you see, you see a progressive language, ideal language, consistent language. When you go to some aspects of the way traditionalists have advocated for Islam, you see so many incons inconsistencies and you see less uh, progressive uh, practice or application of the ideal language which we see in the Quran. And polygamy is not an exception. So when you go back to the uh, Quranic polygamy, you see a pro-family, a pro-women plan, a pro-orphan plan. And we see if you go back to what literally the Quran says about it, if you fear that you won't be uh, fair to orphans, right? And if you, who is you, when we go back to 4 1, ya ayuhannas, O people, right? Then, marry those who please you out of women. مثنى وثلاثة ورباع two three or four the maximum is four again another condition فإن خفتم أن لا تقصتوا أن لا تعدلوا فواحدة if you fear you won't be fair then only one so what do we see in the Quran we see the dialogue addressing يا أيها الناس people which means for people to seek polygamy uh, this is uh, need this needs to be finalized as a court permissibility court order or a law or a law, right? And second, there is a fear that the community won't deal justly with orphans. So it should be an emergency, a state declared emergency, displayed or displaced orphans, displaced orphans that the state won't be able to take care of. Is the state, if the state is still capable of taking care of these orphans, sheltering them, providing them what they need, they don't need to declare that emergency uh, exceptional, I would say, it's not the norm, exceptional permissibility to allow polygamy, right? So it's addressed to the court. You can't go by yourself as a man and you say, I want to have another wife. It's a permissibility, not an order. It's conditional. It's not free or open-ended, right? And la tuqsitu fil yatama, which means you need to be take, responding to that emergency which limits the pool of second wives to mothers of orphans that they can't support, right? Muhammad Shahroor argues for that as well out of so many other scholars. So it's not any woman, not any young, beautiful woman, 20 years younger than you, right? It has, by the way, nothing to do with sexual desire. We don't read it any place in the Quran that the myth that men can't control their sexuality is, is the reason for allowing this. This is all, all language added to what we have in the Quran. What we have in the Quran, just fa strong family system that doesn't wrong with this first wife and allows for exceptional, rare, exceptional uh, uh, permissibility when first it's declared by the court, by the state, emergency that the state can't respond to, uh, mothers of displaced 
orphans and it says it ends which means even if those conditions were all fulfilled and you still fear that you won't be just your family your kids your original family your wife then you can say yes there is a declared emergency there are displaced orphans i'm not going to be uh, adopting a polygamous lifestyle why because you need to be you need to be just your wife and the basics I, one of the basics i take to be just your wife is to take her permission if she says yes to adopting another wife to adopting another family then you you're adil then you're just if she says no too bad then you can't use the quranic permissibility i know many people will be say, like no one will say will say yes no woman will say yes to second wife too bad then you can't use the, the quranic uh, permissibility there are conditions in the quran you need to uh, dance around the truth to say i'm gonna have free loose polygamy good luck with that this is not what the quran says it's clear in the quran it's highly conditioned highly conditioned and the permissibility of the, of the first wife is a condition the quran again can't uh you know uh, command things in one place and uh, deactivate them in another place the quran in 419 says bil ma'ruf. deal with your life wives according to ma'ruf what is fair what is kind what is known to be just al ma'ruf would it be ma'ruf to go behind her back and get a second wife or even get a shallow permission under pressure from her and get a second wife until she's as happy as you with the second marriage you can't seek it this is what i see in the quran and clearly in the history of applying it we see a loose meaning of polygamy that is very uh, it, it, it very similar to pre-islamic polygamy except for they limited the number because it was unlimited number they limited the number to four other than that it's a reincarnation of pre-islamic polygamy and ha has nothing to do with quranic polygamy you know those are very interesting conditions uh for the permiss permissibility of polygyny or polygamy uh, that you brought up because a lot of people non-muslims and even some muslims have a total misunderstanding of what uh, polygyny is for they think it is to satisfy some type of uh, overwhelming male sexual desire or or something of that such when uh, the way that you characterized it it's really not like that it's to serve a function in order to kind of create a stable society so you won't have uh, people left out um you know it's just a very interesting take that i wish more people would kind of um look into and understand because it, it totally paints muslims in a in a very interesting light when that's the way our system of marriage is characterized by other people and we also tend to kind of fall into that trap of characterizing it like that um, but it is what, what is literally mentioned in the Quran. So we're not, you know, projecting things on the Quran because now we're progressive. We want to 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 move with the Quran to a new uh, or to new principles that are not adopted in the Quran. We're just responding. So what I did was just reading the verse to you and trying to make sense of it. Mm. Uh, sexual desire as a reason to seek second marriage is not mentioned even once in the Quran. Mm. But al yatama taking care of orf orphans is there in the Quran. So we're just trying to respond to the Quran. We don't want to play the same game patriarchy played when projected their needs on the Quran uh, by projecting modern needs on the Quran. We just want to be faithful in responding to what we read in the Quran, whether we like it or we don't like it. Right. And uh, you have already explained. I'm sorry, Roxana, were you going to say something? Okay, so I thought about I was going to jump in front of you. Uh, you have already explained how your hermeneutic approach focuses solely on Quranic linguistics and does that and does not take into account secondary sources. But how do you account for the plethora of historical sources across sectarian boundaries that state that almost every major companion of the prophet and his immediate family uh, practice what you view as Islamic polygyny and not Quranic polygyny? Do we have any early secondary sources that support your understanding of uh, Quranic polygyny? Yeah, this is uh, this is a valid concern, and uh, I can tell you. Uh, I'm not I'm not a historian I'm a theologian 
I go to the Quran and there is a limit to what I can do here. I have to be very honest about it. I go to the Quran as a moral ethical guidance, right? I I try to to unlock what is the hidden message of in, in the Quran. Now, what people in history did, I don't even have the capacity or the ability to say for sure what happened in history, let alone to judge the companions for what they did. We don't know for sure what happened. Let's remember the so many difficulties uh, with writing and documenting early Islam. Theologians uh, were historians. So we didn't have really an objective way of writing down history, regardless of the of, of the, the other interests or let's say conflict of interest, right? Now, the other thing, the Quran should judge a uh, human's conduct. It's not the opposite. So I don't go to human's conduct to judge what's in the Quran, right? It's the opposite. This is what I see in the Quran. And I take it as a moral obligation that I'm going to continue to say what I see in the Quran no matter what. Now, does some uh, people's conduct respond to that or not? We don't know the full image. We don't know of everything written in, in, in the uh, in early Islamic history is, is accurate or not. At least in the prophetic uh, uh, legacy, I see many uh, times when the tradition accuses Prophet Muhammad of, of things that is not consistent with what we know about him, or at least with his consistent image in the Quran. For example, the um, story from him marrying to Aisha, when she was as uh, uh, as 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 young as six years old, and finalizing the marriage when she was nine years old, would you give your daughter or sister in marriage to someone in his fifties under any argument? It's not supported in the Quran. Actually, what is supported in the Quran, as I mentioned in four six, that people need to reach the age of sound judgment to be considered marriageable age. But this is what our books of history says. And therefore, I'm very careful when approaching books of history. Again, I'm not historian, and I leave it to historians to decide what really happened, what really took place. I go to the Quran as a theologian, and I try to make sense of it. And I limit my abilities, academic and research abilities, to that. Thank you for that. Uh, have you read the latest PhD on the age of Aisha where it shows the problematic um, nature there of- There are so many of them. I, I don't know what, what research- uh, uh, There was one them. by Joshua Little that came yeah. out recently uh, that you know kind of created a bit of waves because uh, it probably- Is it arguing that. for 18 years? 18 years? 14 years. 14. Because one of the arguments, very convincing arguments, that she was at least 18 years old, at mm -hmm. least or more. There are so many arguments. And based on calculations, uh, I recall Islam al-Bihari from Egypt, one of the uh, widely known uh, voices on arguing against uh, the uh, very early age for, for Aisha and arguing for a conflict between the year of immigration and the year of revelation that took place and ended up with that. But again, when I limit myself to the Quran, I don't have to go through all of that yeah. because I have four six telling me that unless people reach and unless people uh, uh, they're considered mature enough, they reach the the age of 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 rational abilities of or sound judgment, you will be violating the Quran if you finalize any marriage against that. Do the other the other point I want to make. Do the exact date uh, or the exact age uh, matter? I would say no, because the Quran speaks by itself a very baggy language, a very general language. The Quran doesn't hijack people's right to make sense of their uh, uh, institutions, legal, educational, political. So the Quran goes with general conditions. You apply the condition the way you want right? So the age could be different from state to state, from country to country, from time to time, but there's a condition. It's sound judgment. For, for another example, deal with your wives again, according to ma'roof, what is known to be nice and kind. Okay, what is known to be nice and kind? It's in my time, in this place, totally different from when it used to be 100 years ago. Or 
uh, it's going to be different after 100 years. The Quran, because the Quran wants to address all people, leave the language itself able to be interpreted in a very flexible way. Because as they say in sales, the devil is in the details. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, moving away from sort of the, the topic of marriage, in the in the final chapter of your book, you argue that the Quran fully endorses women's political and economic agency. Um, and firstly, in relation to the right to vote, which which firsts do you think secure this right for women? And how do you tally this with the fact that some Muslim countries, at least, only granted female suffrage in the late 20th and even the early 21st century? Right. And it's clear in the Quran. It says, Ya ayuhan nabi, idha ja'aka al-mu'minat yubayi'anaka. Right. And it ends with, fabayi'ahunna, fabayi'ahunna wa stagfir lahunna. If women, prophet, came to you to pledge to you, it ends with, accept from them. And it's clear, it's clear, as the head of the state, the Quran, 14, 14 centuries ago, gave women the right to go, not to send their husbands on behalf of them, but to go to the prophet and uh, to, to pledge to him. Now, why do we have this gap between uh, the Quran and uh, what we end with? The, the gap is seen in all aspects of interpreting the Quran. It's not limited to, to, to the right to vote. And it's, it's very sad. It's very sad that we had it first, we had it before, but we didn't make full sense of it. Same, the same thing applies to uh, so many other rights. Uh, the same thing applies to ending slavery. The Quran had endorsed a plan to end slavery. Had Muslims adopt that, that, that plan, they could have ended the slavery in maximum 100 years, maybe after the revelation of the Quran. Never happened. Never happened. What, what the Arab empire did, they did the opposite. They went into enslaving more people. They were corrupt with their power. They corrupt with their wealth, with everything else. But again, let's be realistic. We argue here for a sacred book, not a sacred history. The problem with so many Muslims, we want to turn everything into sacred. All all you know everything we have is sacred right including the legacy of uh, 14 centuries of of doing islam we're human beings those are human beings they did their best sometimes they prioritized political interests they were successful with with things so advocating with for for the the um, you know the the implementation of everything in the quran as Muslims were very ideal and they were angels in implementing everything. They were human beings. Again, there is a, a sacred text. There is no such a thing like a sacred history. I don't feel as a Muslim, I have an obligation to go and justify every bit of our history. This is what happened. And, you know, some do that. And I, you will be involved if you try to do that in so many apologetic arguments. If you start, you know, with, with that or try to do that i think i think um bearing the distinction in mind that the quran is sacred but our history is all too human is exactly, um, exactly. Is, is really important um um in terms of in terms of the political authority of of women you you sort of you closely analyze the story of the queen of sheba in order to challenge traditional juristic arguments against muslim women holding positions of public leadership um, so how has this story been historically misinterpreted, in your view, by the majority of both classical and modern exegetes? And what interpretive methods and maneuvers were employed, do you think, to sort of distort its egalitarian content? Right. Uh, probably we mentioned this today before, like exegetes, what they did, they interpreted the Quran according to their philosophy of, of what should happen. And for them to have a woman leading the community to assign public authority positions to women was not even an option. They didn't even think of it as something that could be a practical or successful, right? So we had, although we had this story, uh, the a full Quranic story, uh, arguing for, <coughs> I'm sorry, for the Queen of Sheba, in the Quran as a role model, 
as a successful queen, uh, someone who had huge respect from her community, who was leading a council of men, who had a very uh, fruitful and successful inner count with Prophet Solomon that uh, ended with her embracing Islam, and we mean by Islam, submission to God, the big meaning of Islam then, uh, and, and where the Quran never pauses a, a second to say something against that, to the opposite, the Quran praises her, shows us her leadership qualities. We have all of that gone in the history of processing the story. Exegesis were uh, biased in a clear way while, while interpreting the story. And they ended up with using one hadith against what we see in the Quran. And this is what a fallacy I refer to as the using hadith to invalidate the Quranic message. In hadith, uh, there is one hadith that says, لَن يُفْلِحَ قَوْمٌ أَوْ مَا أَفْلَحَ قَوْمٌ وَلُّ إِمْرَهُمْ إِمْرَأَ No people were uh, uh, prosper as long as they assigned their leadership to a woman. So they used that single hadith to active, deactivate everything we can learn about the Queen of Sheba from the Quran, right? Again, this was their understanding that they thought of as ideal and they tried to find it in the Quran, even if that would uh, lead with them just turning their back to what they read in the Quran. And, and how do you think the Quran presents the Queen of Sheba as, as a positive example of female? Full endorsement, full endorsement of her leadership abilities. And uh, the Quran, if we go deep into the language, uh, Solomon is described as someone who was given out of everything. When the hoopoe comes back from uh, the land of the Queen of Sheba, he describes her as someone who was given out of everything, which means he was indicating that she was equal to King Solomon, uh, mm -hmm. not in prophethood, but in leadership abilities. The, what we could know about her, even from the way she behaved, she in the in the story, I don't want to go over the, the full story, but in the story, she when the letter from uh, King Solomon arrives to her court in the beginning, she asks her counsel, main counsel. She says, give me your advice. I never finalize a decision without asking you first, which means she was a democratic leader, right? Uh, the, the men, they said, we are people of power. She says she appeals to her wisdom again. She tries to start by sending him a gift, Diplo diplomacy there, see? So we're moving while, while trying to understand her character across so many positive things that apply to leaders uh, and could be taught in, in, in schools on leadership, on political leadership. The Quran introduces all of that with a huge respect. The legacy was hijacked only by interpreters who interpreted the story in a very shallow way and didn't read uh, the, the, the big message in the story. All right, and thank you for that. And, um, you know, we're finally coming to somewhat towards the end of this podcast, and it's definitely been very enlightening for myself, opened my eyes to a whole lot that, you know, maybe I misunderstood in the book or um, you just brought to light for myself through this speaking engagement. Thank you. Um, finally, you focus on the Quranic understanding of female economic independence and agency by arguing uh, that the Quran was many centuries ahead of its time by proposing that women should be granted financial compensation for domestic work. Uh, you do this by closely examining two key Quranic terms, Ajr and Sidak, if I'm saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the distinction between these two terms and how are they employed differently in the text? Right. So the Quran makes a reference to two uh, different financial rights for wives in marriage. There's first, uh, first Mahar or Sidaq, which is a one time uh, marital gift. Right. It's, it's what goes with your proposal. Right. Uh, it is uh, a gift for uh, a woman just she, because she said yes to your proposal, right? And if she's okay with, with you know, finalizing the marriage without a, a gift, the Quran says, go ahead with that. That's totally fine. But Ajr is a different thing. Ajr is 
uh, based on what a wife or the wife provides in marriage. I know no one calculated this before. I know it's hard to do that now. I can't do that. But if, if we want to really consider it, there should be a way of doing that. It's for the domestic labor that women uh, invest their lives providing within the family, right? I always argue that financial uh, independence is a shortcut to dignity. Whether a woman is at home, working at home, working for her family, or she's working outside, both ways should provide her with that financial stability, right? How to calculate your domestic labor hours? I don't know, to be honest, how to do that. It could be that something the state could provide. It could be something that a husband, according to what he can provide, as an acknowledgement of her uh, unrewarded uh, labor, right? Uh, some some extraordinary uh, circumstances could lead a, a woman to give up on her job, like a special need kid who needs his mommy to be with him all the time, or anything you could imagine. Every woman has the right to have kind of financial stability, to be rewarded for what she 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 do. Uh, uh, otherwise, I take it as as another kind of modern slavery. You mm -hmm. just work, 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 and no one will reward you for, or I even acknowledge you for what you do. But how to get into the details, how we do that, I have no idea how to finalize that. But I see it in the Quran as two rights that were just merged as one right. It's not just mahar. There is something or other rights, financial rights, way beyond mahar. The big picture, the big image, uh, marriage is a spiritual relationship. You should be in marriage because it's based on love, right? Quran says, Out of his miracles, he created for you spouses so you find tranquility with them. So tranquility is the goal of marriage in the Quran. Seeking tranquility and uh, li living in a continuous status of tranquility and love is the only reason for couples, men and women, to be in marriage, right? It's not because he's providing for you. It's not because you have a shelter. It's not because you're going to be homeless, right? It's because you love, you love him. You want to stay with him. And therefore, having uh, economic stability whether from your work outside, which should be the norm, or from your labor inside is what will provide you with that kind of, you know, uh, economic security. Uh, people should stay in marriage because they want to be in marriage, because they love each other, not because they're going to be homeless on the streets without, you know, being in, 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 uh, in relation with, with that man or that woman. Right. And we, I'm sure we know um, some people out there who that's the whole basis of their marriage is out of fear of some type of alienation or not having that economic independence to fall back on. Um, and it's very interesting that you brought this concept up in your book, because I remember just only a couple of years ago, we had um, Andrew Yang, when he was running for the U.S. president, he had put forth this idea of compensating uh, women for their domestic work because of what he's seen how his wife, highly educated woman, uh, chose to stay home and watch their children when they when they started having children. And one of their children is, um, you know, uh, I, I want to say is uh, mentally challenged, if that's mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. uh, proper word to use. Um, and, you know, that just begs the question that, you know, women who choose to stay at home and are highly educated um, are sacrificing that year's right. education, um, the money that they put into uh, be educating themselves in order to serve, the, you know, the purpose of being a, a stay-at-home mother. And, you know, that should be compensated in some type of way. How that's supposed to work out between couple to couple is a interesting topic in and of itself. 
but it definitely should be something that the state should look into because they have the ability to employ some kind of standard amongst people to where it it would be fair for all parties. But um, yeah, that just that aspect of your book I found very interesting, and I really hope somebody takes it and tries to run away with it in our own Western society because um, that is a topic that has come up a lot recently. Is not the role of women per se. I believe we're over that, but. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do for women who want to stay at home and right. quote unquote live be the traditional wives um, that you know some of them want to be? It's a huge start, even if we start by acknowledging and giving you know credit to the Quran that it was there in the Quran. Now, how to do it is a different, a different uh, uh, whole process, right? But let's just start from from saying it was it was there in the Quran. It was acknowledged, so it's there. Let's start from there. Okay, so why, why, how, how did this distinction between the two terms, how, how, how did we lose the distinction between these two terms? Uh, why have they historically been regarded as interchangeable? I even went to the, I have the Abdul Halim Quran right there, and I'm looking at it right now. Even when I went back to the verses that you were speaking about concerning these terms, uh, he he translates it as bride gifts um, in both instances, which. I, I think he does. I, I see you look your eyes right there. I, I'm, I'm hoping he did. Maybe I, I, you know, I don't understand the Arabic, but yeah, it seems like he kind of has just one translation fits all for these two terms, even though they don't seem to be interchangeable. Right. You know, let's always remember that a process in the Quran, making sense of the Quran, interpreting the Quran was done in a total absence of any female exegetical voices. So even if we had a council of angel men, right, trying to do their best, it's going to express their self-interest, their best interest in the first place is going to marginalize what the woman could see there. Maybe it's a shallow way of interpreting it, but uh, so many aspects uh, in the Quran, they're just lost. And, and this is just one example of them. It's unfortunate. Uh, and what do you think would be the social consequences for women if this initiative was actually implemented? How does uh, this relate to the Quranic worldview of, of women's rights, this concept of ajr? Uh, I would say it's more fair to women, more fair to women. And uh, uh, one of the goals of the Quran, God commands adil, justice, and ihsan, and uh, being good to, to your relatives. So we will be, by, by doing that, uh, reaching one of the ideals of the Quran, we're going to be more just, uh, absolutely, definitely more just to the unacknowledged uh, domestic labor that women, you know, uh, all women I know are involved in without adequate acknowledgement from anyone. So in your conclusion, you emphasize that in terms of all of these, uh, these different interpretations that you have, unlike many traditional approaches to Quranic exegesis, you are not making sort of any claim of epistemic certainty that excludes and just terminates all other opinions, but you instead want to want to pave the way for future similar examinations of the Quranic text with your own tafsir. Um, so what future do you see for female scholarship in Quranic studies and, and what specific avenues do you hope it's going to pursue? Um, so it's a discourse, it's a dialogue, it's individual uh, different attempts to read the Quran and to think the Quran. It's uh, uh, as much as it's individual, it's it's collective responsibility at the end of the day. No one could go and say, uh, it's written in stone, my interpretation is finalized. I could find things uh, that uh, someone could uh, find mistakes in what, what I already found. And uh, if I'm really honest in trying to find the truth in what I'm reading, I should go with the with the honest uh, uh, critiques and make sense of them. So to say that this is final, to say to to uh, duplicate what what was done by medieval scholars, we're going to be committing the same mistake, right? So it's it's open ended. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. Let's learn from from each other. Progressive readings today are going to sound very obsolete and old and will stop working for generations coming after us. We're doing our best. Let's keep it open and let's uh, learn from those who paved the way for us and keep it open for those who's going to come and going to correct us. And we'll, we'll have uh, uh, so many 
good things and bad things to say about us. Let's let's open to, to everyone. And uh, the, the the last advice for readers is not to lose their self confidence while uh, making sense of the Quran and uh, making sense of uh, how to interact with the Quran in their daily lives because the the message in a way or or, or another at least my generation we've been told in in traditional schools and and madras and the concept of traditional religious teaching is just listen and obey just listen and obey don't try to make sense of it uh won't work anymore it works maybe for us but now you know my my kids my students they want you to, to go deep into things they're open to critical thinking which is a positive thing if you really believe in this religion, critical thinking will make you even uh, trust it more. If you have concerns, then you you don't you're not. Uh, I, I don't. I won't say good believer or bad believer. There's no such thing as a bad believer. But but don't shy away from things. The closer you get to the image, you will understand it more. Um. You you also note that, as you said previously earlier, that that due to the rise of the internet in particular we now live in a very different intellectual environment um so in, in which lay muslims no longer need to sort of rely on their local shape for knowledge but instead they can at a click of a button access you know academic work libraries manuscripts and also most importantly institutionally marginalized voices that wouldn't they that mm -hmm. simply didn't have a platform before um so but obviously at the same time, the internet is a very is a very neutral medium, and it provides a platform for both sort of progressive marginalized voices, traditionalist voices, and also very radical discourse. So how do you hope progressive reformists are going to use the internet to their advantage? And are you at all concerned that we are increasingly seeing some quite extreme voices also having a wider reach due to the nature of the internet? Yeah, at the end of the day, I would say it's all about making choices. So there is no way you can run away or hide from your responsibility of making your own choices, even with who I read for, what uh, resources I access. The good and the bad are there. And this is the beauty of it. You make your own choices, right? The sense of censorship that someone is making choices for me, including the government, doesn't mean that it will end with the best outcomes, right? So it's all there, the voices of who represents mainstream Islam and the voices of who represent the opposition for any reason. And it's your responsibility as a human being at the end of the day to go and make rational choices. This is the meaning of your existence. So trying to say that I'm not going to make choices won't help you. We make choices whether we admit that or not all the time. Even for people, for example, who tell you I did this because I followed this fatwa by this imam. So there are so many other imams. Why did you go with this specific fatwa of this specific imam? Because you chose that specific imam and that fatwa. So it's your choice at the end of the day. What the internet is doing to, to the Muslim community is what printing did for Christianity. It's making it, you know, more available, more widespread, more open to everyone. It's a democratic platform for everyone, which I like, which I like, and uh, which is bringing uh, um, uh, positive outcomes. It could be some negative outcomes, but the positive is way more than the negative. Definitely the ignorant masses or the awam aren't so ignorant or not as ignorant as they used to be. And, you know, it comes as a double edged sword, but hopefully it leans more towards benefit than negativity. Right. At least no one can dictate who I should listen to and when. Right. It's uh, me. I'm going making choices, uh, whether I like them or not, whether uh, some of the available options really make valuable contribution or not you decide at the end of the day at least it's, it's your freedom uh your free access to knowledge i would say and uh roxana and i thoroughly enjoyed reading your book we talked about it uh, a lot as we were constructing this script uh right here you know writing down questions and whatnot and uh you know it really had a lot of different features to it uh academic uh religious uh good advice pertaining to marriage and, you know, even if people don't find, a, a, I don't want to say your arguments convincing, um, I still feel that there's a lot to take from your book in regards to, like I mentioned, uh, marriage, 
Um, it has a, a it, it's very it's not very religiously centered, but it has aspects of religion in there, and, and it's very academic all in one. So I really encourage people to go out and uh, read your book because you know doing these interviews, we can never do justice to the work that our guests actually put into the work uh, itself. Um, but this is our last question right here, and thank you for um, your time. And sorry if this might have. You know, we really need to work on um, keeping these things within the time frame that we tell people. But um, what message or encouragement would you like to convey to your readers as they embark on the journey of exploring your book and its insights into the Quran's perspective on egalitarianism? Uh, in one word, to keep it short, uh, uh, follow, have self-confidence in yourselves. And uh, it is within the Quran. Uh, probably this is for the the the, the people uh, with interest in in following uh, uh, the authentic Quranic message, because usually objection comes from the uh, religiously committed people. In one word, it's following the Quranic command to tadabur and tafakkur to think. Mm -hmm. So if if we're doing this, we're just responding. If we're doing tafakkur, if we're doing thinking, rethinking, uh, investigating what the Quran says. This all is what the Quran asks uh, readers of the Quran to do. So we're not doing anything uh, bid'ah, you know, or or trying to implement agendas, whether you know feminist or I'm using you know, in a sarcastic way feminism. Of course, I, I, I elaborated the gender egalitarianism or Western, you know, or Orientalist agendas. It is responding to the Quranic message itself, the the, the message of tadabur and tafakkur. Thank you for that. And Dr. Abla Hassan, is there anywhere that uh, people can reach you? I'm not sure if you're on social media, um, but I believe you do have an Academia EDU page. For, uh, for I, I have uh, I have my... Uh, uh, you do uh, have a website and we'll leave a link in the description. Oh, a website. I have a website. I have a YouTube channel. It's a small YouTube channel just for, because I'm the coordinator of the Arabic Studies program as well at UNL. So I post what we do there. And uh, my email is provided both in my website and in the YouTube channel, and anyone can reach out to, to me anytime. Uh, I should end by uh, thanking both of you for your uh, smart uh, uh, questions and for your serious engagement with the book. Thank you so much. And you're welcome, Dr. Habla, uh, Dr. Hassan. Um, the pleasure was ours um, reading your book, and uh, we can't wait to see what else you have uh, coming out. Uh, you actually have a few more other books that we should probably, or that we uh, can engage with in the meantime, so we hope to do that, especially the one on Al Kidder. Um, I think uh, Roxana has already read it, um, but hearing it from her, she just made it sound that much more interesting, so. Thank you so and, much. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.